Welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, learning how to follow Jesus in a post-Christian culture. My name is Ben Pierce. I'm the host of the show and uh, just have a, a small group, not not the full a cohort of regulars. We just have my brother joining me, Aaron. What's up? Hello, hello. Good to be here. Yeah, you know, when we got the the heavy hitters, the serious guests, the ones with the then we've got to bring on, you know, we, yep. we've got to we got to limit the risk. We, yep. We've got some Understood. shenanigans with the regular crew. And it's just, uh, you know, we just can't risk that. So uh, we're very excited about our show today. We will be talking with Mark Sayers. He is the senior leader of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he is passionate about spiritual renewal and the future of the church. Uh, Mark is the author of a number of books, uh, including Strange Days and Reappearing Church. Uh, but if you're like me, you were first introduced to Mark uh, because of the popular podcast, This Cultural Moment, uh, and his um, brilliant contribution to that and really uh, something that that really opened my eyes to a lot of the reality outside of the church. And it's something that we really deal with in the space we live in as well as Steiger. And so uh, it was really cool to, to to be able to learn and grow from that podcast and now have him on our podcast. So it's, uh, it's an exciting show for you. Um, God has used uh, Mark powerfully and continues to do so. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, about his new book, uh, A Non-Anxious Presence, how a changing and complex world will create a remnant of renewed Christian leaders. Uh, we'll talk about anxiety, uh, how we can respond to it, how could we can be a witness in, in the middle of the crisis of anxiety, uh, but also just about secularism in general, uh, the post-Christian world that we live in, and how we can best uh, respond as followers of Jesus. Uh, so normally, we talk a little bit about Steiger, what's going, around, uh, going on in the world around us in Steiger, uh, but we want to just get straight to the guest today. We don't have a ton of time. Uh, so without any further shenanigans and interruptions, we're going to bring on our guest. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. No, absolutely. Uh, it's great to be here and a real pleasure. Yeah, we appreciate the uh, the, the time zones here in Australia, from what mm -hmm. I understand. So I'm actually kind of amazed. It's 5 p.m. here. It's 8 a.m. there. So that seems like a bigger gap than it normally is. Because we, we spent eight years living in New Zealand. So I oh, okay. you know, yeah, so we're familiar with that that part of the world. Mm. And uh, yeah, so thank you for being here. We, we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a joy. So here's what we want to do. Uh, we talked a little bit before we started, um, and you mentioned that we don't necessarily have to stick only on the topic of the book. Um, and, and to be honest, like for me, the whole space that you speak in and the books that you've written, I really could go in a million different directions with you because I think it's it's so relevant in terms of how it overlaps with the thing we're passionate about, which is we see a world that is far from God, that is alone, uh, that is confused, that, of course, is anxious, as your book suggests. Um, and, and we're asking ourselves, first of all, how are, are those things affecting us? How can we be whole and, and solid followers of Jesus? And then how can we see crisis as opportunity uh, as you lay out in your book? Um, and so maybe starting with your book, can you explain a little bit? Um, about our anxiety problem as a culture? How, how did we get here? And more than just sort of something that people throw out all the time, depression, anxiety, why is it so important to understand it? Uh, and, and how have we gotten to the place that we are today? Mm. Well, I think for me, there's sort of two conversations that have been happening around anxiety. First of all, there's a conversation that's been going, I think for a few decades, where people are talking about mental health. And mental health is a very wide um, you know, group of different disorders. And you know, it could be anything from schizophrenia to obsessive compulsive disorder. So that conversation has been going on. And I think it's been a really healthy one where people perhaps felt in different cultures, but I think in many cultures, uh, a sense of stigma and shame to talk about that. And I think often we just thought about <clears throat> health from a physical body perspective, but also realizing how you know, the mind can suffer ailments just as the body can. So I think that's been going on. And so anxiety disorders are part of that sort of group of different disorders. Um, but then there's this other thing going on, which I began to notice where it's like that particular word has just grown. Now, mm -hmm. some of what we know is that every sort of culture has a subset of, you know, certain disorders. So you can find if you're in Tonga or Japan or Norway, yeah, you'll find a group of people who may suffer with schizophrenia. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the actual explosion of amount of people who are experiencing anxiety, it's some, I just had this sense, something else is going on here. There's a, 
personal disorder that people experience, but there's some cultural dynamic and it's almost become a word we've used yeah. to describe something happening culturally. So I think that's what I was really interested in. Why, why has this seemingly gone beyond just a disorder to almost becoming a cultural phenomenon? Yep. And yeah, you know, we can dig apart this in more detail, but my simple explanation is I think there's a sense of cultural anxiety because one of the stories that we've told about the world that things will get better, things will mm -hmm. get more comfortable, things will progress to this sort of wonderful future. That story doesn't align with the reality that we're yep. seeing. Yep. And that's just been growing. You know, you think about these sort of shocks of 9-11 to then, you know, there's still a few years go by the global financial crisis, rise of ISIS, you know, terrorism. But then it just seems to have just gotten quicker and quicker. And then COVID, you know, war in Ukraine, all the economic news at the moment, environment. Yeah. So I think that that's really, I think, what, you know, is driving this bigger, bigger dynamic of anxiety. That's good. Yeah, that was kind of my question, because what is what is what are the factors that play into anxiety? And and you could, you know, part of it is like, what is really anxiety and what is just trend or buzz word kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. But like, my, I guess my question is, how much of it is is true external factors that are contributing to anxiety? And how much of it is actually a worldview, a secular worldview that doesn't have good answers for suffering or trials or difficulty, right? Like that, that's part of it. So how much of it would you contribute to the rise of a secular ideology that, that struggles to handle hardship versus external factors, technology and other things that are, are how would you play that out in terms of the causes of anxiety? Yeah, that, that's a great um, setup. And I think, you know, firstly, I would say, you know, if, if you're someone who feels that you do have an anxiety disorder, that is that is a disorder that you're experiencing, it's really important to get medical help. And that's something which can help you discern what is sort of cultural, what is something that, you know, you're personally going through. But I, I think you're right. The, the big talking about it now is that bigger phenomenon. Um, I think that biggest story is the story of secularism. You know, if you think about if you go back to 1989, um, you had this end of an era, which was the Cold War. The world had really been caught between these two sort of giant blocks of communism and, and sort of liberal democracy. And people thought that those two would, you know, continue on struggling with each other. They weren't, they called it a Cold War because they weren't actually firing, you know, cannons at each other, but it was an information war. It was an economic war. It was a propaganda war. And when in 1989, you know, you saw communism fall all throughout Europe, it was a huge shock because all yeah. of a sudden what people thought would continue on wasn't. And it was this moment of elation. There was a, a song by the band Jesus Jones, you know, where he's talking about watching TV. It came out at that moment. He's watching TV and you know, he's seeing the Berlin Wall fall. And, and not long after that was the fall of apartheid in South Africa and the release of Nelson Mandela. So all of a sudden there was this tremendous optimism. We went from fear of nuclear war to tremendous optimism. And I think that then set the belief that, hang on, secularism can do it. Post-Christianity can do it. We're going to not have recessions anymore. We're going to get rid of war. We're going to get rid of poverty. Everything's just going to slide to this smooth war. So I think you're right. It's the ideology behind that, which now is is looking moribund. It's, it, it's falling over. And that, that creates an anxiety in us and the culture. How much of it would you say also is that? It's the, the larger macro ideologies about sort of the utopian trend that we're on. Um, but if I, if I think about my own life as a follower of Jesus and all that I know about what's true in the nature of reality, and yet I live in a world that, that is, it's, it's meritocratic. It says that not only should the world progress to this utopian place, but I personally should get everything I want. I should be good at everything. If, if I want it, I can have it. I should be successful in whatever I try. And, and, and that, that lie really causes even me as a follower of Jesus, you know, I wouldn't put it in those terms. I would put good Christian language around it, but I, I've had seasons of my life where, where I get these pits in my stomach because I have to be all these things because I'm told I can be if I just want to. So how much of it is it, is it that also married with this, this lie we're told on an individual level, which is to say your life should also be everything you want it to be and everything should be easy and whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve because that also creates a spiraling sense of activity as I fail to live up to the things that I'm told I should have and yet continue to be told it's just just there if I would reach out to grab it. 
Yeah, there's a there's a two two dynamics in this. So there's the big story which we've just been outlining, but that big story is almost created to facilitate a smaller story in your life. Sure. To give to give you an example, I was listening to this podcast about Chinese history, and they were reading. I think it was the diary of a young woman who was living through the Cultural Revolution in China, and she had these couple of lines. I'm not going to get them exactly right, but to paraphrase, she said, "My life is nothing. I have no identity." I am simply an individual cog in the giant machine that is China and and the communist state that China is building. Jeez. And I heard that. That is so different to what I feel about my life. I see I have an identity, I have a life. But her worldview and the worldview that her society was pushing is your life is irrelevant. You're just a cog making this bigger machine better. Now, we don't have that story. So what was unique about this era that we've coming out of is that that story that everything's progressing and getting better it was also saying you don't need to think about politics you don't need to think about the big issues they're all going to disappear just live your best life the mm-hmm. world is now a playground mm-hmm. you don't have to sacrifice you just go on and do your thing and it went from you know some people described it as a world which is here's all the things that like we you look at some societies and there's tremendous cultural pressure to not do these certain things so we went from a culture like that don't do these certain things where you're sort of almost depressed by what you can't do to where we had unlimited horizon of freedom. So we became impressed by what I should be doing. Yep. So it's not like someone telling you, don't do that. You're now being impressed, looking on Instagram going, why is everyone else's lives so much more successful than mine? You know, everyone's fitter and, and wealthier and happier. So you're hundred percent right. That's the big story. But I think how we feel it is how it manifests in this, this individual ideology. Yeah, it's, it, it, that's, oh man, there's so many places. Like I think about like the pop psychology of what we have today. I, I remember I sent Ben, there's a guy, I don't know if you're familiar with him, Jay Shetty. He's like this pop cultural um, psychologist, like all the celebrities are into him. And I was sending Ben this thing and it was like, you know, we're, the whole idea is just pursue your dreams. It's all about you. Do what makes you happy. And and yet it seems like it's just creating more anxiety and more anxiety um, in that whole, you know, I don't know the, the exact quote, but the, the sense of meaninglessness is not because of too much pain or suffering. It's because of too much pleasure. And, and like, how does that whole thing play into this anxiety where we where our, the pursuit of all of that freedom and choices is actually making us more anxious? Mm. I, I think about my grandfather, who's yeah, he's passed away a few years ago, but he you know, grew up in a very working class area in Melbourne. You know, he had two jobs. He had to work the night shift at the fact at a newspaper factory, delivering the, the newspapers in the morning. You know, he lived in a sort of poorer working class area. If you gave him the life that many of us experience, he just would think he'd won, you know, yep. the, the lottery. Um, but he, because his expectations were different. You know, he had low expectations. You know, I remember he went on a holiday just to the next state, Tasmania. And that was just amazing for them. They did that later in their life. And my grandmother and my grandfather. So people's expectations were lower in different cultures. What we're being oppressed by is incredibly inflated expectations. Yep. And, you know, I, I just read a book by Peter Zaihan. He's sort of a global strategist, you know, and he talked about the fact that we've lived through this period where all these things just clicked into line of global supply chains, of the economy being in this percent in a particular way that the whole world working in one trade block, we could click something and get it on Amazon and it'd be built in a factory in China, be with us in in days. And he's like, that world's ended in 2019 yeah. or it's yeah. coming down. So yeah. Yeah. we've got inflated expectations, but we're moving into a period where society can't deliver what our expectations are, and that's creating anxiety. Yeah, it, it's interesting how the most um, wealthy or free countries actually have the highest rates of anxiety and depression and suicide. Places like Norway, where where everything's essentially free and they have all this surplus, that's where the highest rates of depression and anxiety found. Or it's even weird where like things like death metal is really popular there. Like, what is that? So I don't know. It's I think that adds to your point that. It, I think it's just the fact that the, the the fact that the truth we all know is that those things can't satisfy. Those mm. things don't meet the the desires of our heart, and yet mm. we continue to pursue them. And even though it leads to anxiety and emptiness and and all of that, so I don't know how how is that? How do we respond to that? How do we speak truth to culture and also mm. not um, buy into it ourselves? Mm. Yeah, if you. You know, I think part of this is, you know, I'm deliberately using the word stories here because I think this is what you could call a story war. 
you know, mm-hmm. it's a battle of narratives. Totally. Yeah. And you know, if, if you think about um, what the message of our culture is, is here we have this incredible, you know, particularly the developed world, you know, possibly one of the most sort of prosperous cultures in history. Okay, so what's the fruit of that? Well, effectively, is have this life, get educated, you know, find someone who's your soulmate, and then what? Go to heaps of restaurants, go to IKEA. A lot of holidays. And then what? Yep. Go on holidays yep. and then die. Yep. <laughs> That's it. You know, and go, if you've been to those restaurants, go to some more restaurants. They and all look on the holidays, same. Go on more. It, yep. it's, it's all the same. You know, and you travel around the world and you increasingly see how you know, parts of the world all look the same, you know? Yep. And Every so that's beach. the story. Every beach, you know, yep. the same Instagram things, the same stores, coffee shops. And I think that story, it, it's, it's blown up beyond what it is. It's, it's like we've inflated that story. But that story, you know, Augustine, famous Christian, you know, yep. in the, in the yep. sort of, um, you know, called the Dark Ages, but, yep. you know, um, a couple few centuries after the church, you know, he said he had this statement that our hearts are restless until you know god finds its home in our hearts and there's this god-shaped hole is another yep. language yep. and i think that's the story that that's a different story like yeah holidays are great go to a restaurant's fantastic but these things cannot fill that deep you know eternity is in our hearts and it can't be filled so we're, we're trying to tell people a deeper story and i think there is at this moment a tremendous opportunity because the story i, I reckon 10 years ago, it was a lot harder to say this thing's falling over, that it's yep. empty. People are seeing it They now. still bought you know it. I mean? yep. They still bought it. I totally. mean, I saw one video I saw which got a lot of traction online when the war in Ukraine first started was it was a young woman, sort of creative. I think she even had her like laptop under her arm and she was in a, a camp in Poland. She'd just gotten to the border, like lots of people getting out. And she was sort of saying like, you know, two days ago, I was sitting in a cafe with all my cool friends in in Kiev, and 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 now I'm here, and she's like, my life's just been upended in 48 hours, and and she's like, I've still got to do work today, and she just starts start crying. Now I reckon that cut through. I saw so many people were commenting on that because people went for the first time. That could be me. Yeah. When people saw the war in Syria, war in Ethiopia, a lot of people were like, that's ah, oh, that's different. It's another world. But I think there's something where people are now seeing this thing's fragile. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I do, I do think you're starting to see little bits of evidence of the culture outing itself in a sense. There's a, a song called Numb Little Bug that I actually shared with you, Aaron. It's this yep. very depressing pop song. And the chorus is, do you ever get a little bit tired of life? Like you're not really happy, but you don't want to die. Like you're hanging on by a thread, but you got to survive. Like your body's in the room, but you're not really there. Like you have empathy inside, but you don't really care. Like you're fresh out of love, but it's been in the air and I'm past repair. And that's just the chorus. Mm. Mm. And uh, I mean, I can send the link to you. But it's it's a really, I mean, it's a brilliant song. And that's the the weird paradox of it. It's very catchy and super depressing. Mm. Mm. And so I think you're starting to see the culture out itself. But but what I've seen is, and, and you talk about this, is that I, I think what this has done is that people are latching on to causes. I mean, you see, yep, I was going to say, you see the U- activism, right? You see the Ukraine war as okay. Well, the holidays aren't working, but maybe doing this or the environment or whatever else. And do you, I, I have a, a, a part of this conversation that relates to where I maybe see the church doing this in a wrong way. Like we're, we're going into our own tribes or tribalism or sides or camps from the world's perspective. I totally actually get it. So maybe we could start there. It, do you, is is this an opportunity actually that 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 they're for lack of better options? Well, and it's not that these causes are even bad in themselves necessarily, mm. but do you see that as well? Is that kind of a reaction to to the the sort of the the, gig the meaninglessness? Being up? Of, yeah, the of meaning. pleasure. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. So I, I think there is this definite sort of like reaction to perhaps ten years ago, where you know I I, I did a number of talks years ago on Paris Hilton you know, as an emblematic figure, <laughs> you know, it was because she just was like, here I am, She's I'm like, about money, almost no morals, you know, I'm just going to sleep with who I want, have money. This is the new cultural icon. And I think part of what we're seeing is a reaction to that period of just like, almost, you know, lack of morals, immorality, and the culture's like, we've got to have some morals. So we've got to like, now go in this, you know, it's like, you know, there's a classic, you know, it's attributed to to Chile and the church father where he said, you know, the gospel's always crucified, but just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, the gospel's always stuck between irreligion and religiosity. 
as two extremes to different to the gospel. And I think we were in the irreligion yeah. phase and now we've like pushed back to the super religious, yeah. you know, phase, but it's sort of, so we're seeing a secular return to religiosity. It's like, you know, I'm sinful. This is sinful. We need to work on it. And there's some of that is, is definitely sinful, but is the trying harder thing going to solve it? Yeah. And I think the second thing as well is we've come out of an age of the image. So what yeah. we've been told is by changing the images, and creating almost like a marketing perspective around something, we can change some of these big issues. Um, you know, and I think when Ukraine kicked off and started as a war, I'm like, this is going to be a wake up lesson because initially, okay, let's put the flag up. Let, let's, let's mm -hmm. do something now. Let, let's raise some money. I'm thinking this is going to grind on like Putin. Mm -hmm. is, this is the, like, this is the sort of former Soviet idea of war, yep. you know, and you read, you know, Russian history and you're like, this is going to grind on for years. How are people going to, deal with when the fact that this doesn't go away and it's not an event it's a process yep. so I, I think that what we're going to start to see my, my prediction is we're in the activist stage but i wonder whether they're going to actually end up in the nihilistic stage yep. because and i think it's already happening with some gen z gen z gen z because they're starting to say hang on none of this is changing like i'm trying all these things and it's hopeless so there's yeah. almost this doomer thing where yeah. I could see we go next, which is almost what that song's saying, but not just about the personal, but also the political. Right. Because like societal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah societal yeah. change is so hard. And almost what we've been told is, oh, if we just have a big campaign and have some sporting events and put these posters up and change our Facebook profile to this, yep. the world will change. It, it's really hard to change yeah. the world. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, it's man, it's interesting because um, I think there, there's there's multiple responses. Uh, one of them is a lot of people have rejected the materialism, maybe of their parents, because what it led to was divorce and unhappiness or whatever, and and they've pursued kind of uh, experiential living, right, free and minimalistic and van life hashtag and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But and and then there's like the rise of activism and the desire to to kind of give yourself to a cause because it feels like you're it's more than just pursuing. But at the same time, it's also a deep sense of, of numbing ourselves to escapism, where I just keep scrolling TikTok until the, the big scary thoughts go away, right? Like, and so escapism and numbing, I'll give you a good example that was really interesting and shocking to me. So we have a pretty vibrant um, team in Ukraine. And so I was actually in Ukraine myself in Kiev three weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I went to a party um, that was being hosted and I felt like I was in a Zoolander movie where all these pretty people drinking their coffees, you know, like, ha you know, social media. And there was a bit of an activism vibe to it as well. But it was so weird because it was like a country at war and numbing themselves to that reality by just not thinking about it, by having fun, by having this party. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a pretty visceral example of what a lot of us do. Is, is so on, on one hand, there's depression, anxiety. On the other hand, it's just numbing myself through escapism, whether it's video games or social media or, or even drugs and alcohol or whatever. So mm -hmm. how much of that plays into this? And then, of course, that creates anxiety and depression as well. So mm -hmm. is, have you seen that play into this as yes. well? Yeah, I mean, two things come to mind. One is, I mean, this is, we're almost heading towards the sort of cyberpunk Blade Runner future. Yes, yes. <laughs> like That's like exactly. where it's like you know sort of dystopian society but then people are sort of stuck in these like sort of virtual spaces um you know, I, I think what's happened is that that vision of we can make the world this perfect comfortable place and we're progressing towards it and we can control the world and the world is your playground we've now realized that's not working so we've shrunk that vision down to my little world and i'll just escape and the algorithms can take me to the happy place mm. um so i think you're exactly right that there is this now you know, and, and this is what I say, like, I, I'm a big advocate on, you know, practices and spiritual disciplines and stuff like that. But, you know, I've been saying to people just a little bit lately, just be careful that that's not the whole thing for you, because there's a danger, you just start to control your little faith world. Mm. Um, and you have a faith which is disconnected to the rest of the world, like those things are there to shape us, you know, in, in the way of Jesus, the world. to yeah. engage the world, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, so I think there is this real danger of retreat. Yep, um, totally. That is a huge temptation. And I think even you mentioned drugs, alcohol, you know, numbing ourselves. And that, that's where I wonder whether things will go to even the sort of doomer, just numbing, nihilistic, nihilistic yep. checking yeah. out sort of thing. There, there seems to also be like, if that's the flight reaction, because even just thinking of it from a Christian perspective for a second, um, there, there's the, the retreat response that we can do as followers of Jesus, where we just say, this is too much for me. I'm out. 
but it also feels like there is a kind of an arming up intellectually where it's like, okay, I need to know about all the big, bad ideologies out there. All of all the things that are causing me anxiety, it's, you know, Marxism and liberalism and this and that and that. And I just need to get as much of the right information in my head to, to guard myself and my family. And it just kind of creates this ideological separation where you can't even now talk. I mean, we're talking about engaging the world. These people see the world as the enemy. So, so how much of, how much of, that do we need to be guarded against like because yes information matters yes it's important that we know what's going on but aren't we equally at risk of just becoming creating an us versus them dichotomy when when we see our response to anxiety to arm ourselves up intellectually and to just know all the right answers because that's not going to change the world either no and look you know my experience is you know i think i think learning things well is really helpful for people you know when there's a plausibility you know issue and they want to see that the Christian faith can be something that's not just of the totally. heart, but the mind. Yep. But I also see that, you know, most of, I, I, I'm str- I'm in my head, I'm trying to think of people I know have come to faith in Jesus who purely, it was just an intellectual you know, exercise. You know, I've started there with people when you're sharing the gospel, but there's a point where the, the sort of barricades come down and this is a heart issue. So I think number one, you're not going to argue the world into faith is a really yep. key thing. Yep. Now I, I see partially what it is too, is that, information never creates transformation mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you know we need a world of transformation of the heart yep. that that's the yep. starting point yep. and i think you know we're creating just another bubble like if we're talking about the big bubbles there's the bubble of the world there's this perfect place there's the the individual bubble of people in Kiev, like having you know a party but you're right there's this church bubble and it's almost we're doing the same thing and i think partially what happened was i've thought about this that in the past you could you had churches which could just retreat like they could exist in a city and everyone just knew everyone there it was a mini social bubble we yeah. can't socially do it anymore because of because of the internet so we're now intellectually doing it so you can't mm-hmm. have a sort of christian uh you know bubble subculture you know like you think about people you know they only know christians at their church they only play yeah. in the christian basketball comp they only yeah. go to a christian school you could do that physically relationally you can't do that anymore because of the internet and yep. just the connectivity of the world so we're creating an intellectual christian subculture which pushes everything out but what you do like what i always say is often you'll look at the far enemy so you're yep. looking at you know if, you, if you're worrying about conservatives yep. and they're the far enemy you're more likely to be co-opted by the one that's closer to you you know maybe the left if you're more worried about the left and marxism you're probably more likely to be co-opted by the one that's closer to you so there's an element too where i think you know the gospel comes and calls all ideologies to bow their knees yeah and that that creates this beautiful humility where you know you can say this critiques us like the church has a critique of itself um you know always in the scriptures where the church has always been in a sense being compared or that you know the church as is existing is being compared to the kingdom so i think that's actually a beautiful thing that the world needs more of self-critique uh in a way that's not pouring of religious sort of coals on our head yeah yeah and jesus doesn't he didn't come to make dumb people smart right but yes, spiritually yes. dead people alive yeah. and, and yeah. that's sometimes i think we forget that that depending on the world you're in christian right. world you're in mm. yeah but anyway. okay, can i just say something so just a, a point that came to like one of the things that that christianity did is it got rid of dueling and you know people would often fight and you know that was a way you dealt with like there'd be groups you know factions and they would often fight physically you know and and that continued on for a while but one of the things in the awakenings it slowly sort of got rid of dueling and i think what this is, is a return of intellectual dueling sure. online yeah, yeah, and yeah. comment sections and and you know replies oh, on yeah. twitter and that so you know christians are not called to duel yeah maybe there's like a non-lethal version of dueling that we could bring back just to take yeah. the edge off, you know, like paint, yeah. paintball or yeah. Yeah, nerf, I don't know, because the whole nerf, white nerf glove nerf. slap thing sounds kind of yeah. cool, you know, and it might solve problems yeah. more directly. I don't know, that's just me, but yes, no, it's good. <laughs> uh, man, um, one one thought I had just thinking about this topic and is, um, you know, we live in increasingly this very anxious world, and you said in, in one of the things that I've heard you say in your book and in other interviews is this whole concept of. The one that stays calm in the, the crisis is the leader, is the one that people look to. And, and it, I thought that's incredibly makes sense because the whole idea of a Christian 
uh, to me, uh, Christians need to be in the world and they need to be amongst the people and engage in culture. But what, what should distinguish us from the world is not necessarily our moral superiority in the sense that we sleep around less or drink less or smoke less or whatever. It's supernatural peace. It's yeah. supernatural joy and hope. It's something that, like you said, it's not just information, it's transformation that is literally supernatural. Mm -hmm. That I can have peace when the world's falling around me. I can have hope when I, when I or joy when, I, when my you know, father has cancer or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is what the world will see. And it's even what, mm -hmm. what 1 Peter 3.15 says, it's what, uh, an answer for the hope not the mm -hmm. moral superiority. And so I think in an anxious world, that supernatural, you know, you know fruit of the spirit is more important mm -hmm. than ever. So how do we, mm -hmm. how do you, how would you react to that? And how do we live that out in a secular anxious world? Mm. Yeah, so the, the, there's an idea which I, I play with in the book, which is by a, a rabbi, but he's also a family therapist called Edwin Friedman, which was called the, you know, it's because of the non-anxious presence. And his argument is that culture will always trend to the anxious. You know, and that starts in really small ways from just someone gossiping with someone like, how did you find that meeting? Was that okay? You know, like we love to talk about negative things and negative things go very quickly. Gossip travels far. And that I think in our digital age has been just supercharged, you know, so on the internet, yeah. Yeah. bad news travels quickly. You know, if, it, if, if I started screaming at you guys here and, you know, through the mouse at the screen and stormed off, and then you put it up online, that would like just, get, you know, it'd be a thing, you know, like, yeah, oh, interesting. can you please it. do that? That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll set that up afterwards. Yeah, okay. we'll, uh, it can be the promo. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so there's this thing where we, we, and I think this is the link to our fallen natures, that there's something where a disconnection from God creates an anxiety in us. You know, you see Cain in the scriptures, oh, right. it's always wandering east of Eden, you know, and so what Friedman said was that actually the person who in the anxious human system can actually be the non-anxious presence is the one who brings leadership and brings healing. Now, we do have a little model of that in our culture in terms of the person who can leave the rat race behind and goes and meditates on top of some mountain in Thailand and yep. is just so filled with Which peace. is a big thing. Yep. Yeah, but they're actually exiting the culture. Yeah. Like what Friedman was talking about is actually being in the most anxious place and being a non-anxious presence is actually what brings healing. There's no point going and doing it on a mountaintop when you're not around anyone or apart from some other people who do the same thing. Now, I found it incredibly compelling argument, which I think is true. What I what I couldn't get across was I can't do that my own strength. Like, like I've mm -hmm. tried. <laughs> it's so mm -hmm. hard. When someone's sabotaging you, when they're coming at you and, and hitting all your buttons. It's really, really difficult. And there's just something which comes up inside of us. And you, maybe you can keep the exterior, but there's something just tearing you up inside. But I realized, you know, scripture promises the peace that transcends all understanding. And you're right, it's supernatural. You know, I, I think of a, a, a woman, you know, when, when I think of who are the most Jesus-y people I've ever met, I think, of, I think of a woman who had just received a cancer diagnosis that I visited in hospital, led this in, incredible life. But her time in the hospital where Jesus came so close and you almost were just bathing in like the presence of God coming through her. It was just incredible. You know, I think about another guy who was a displaced person who lived through a civil war. He'd almost been executed, um, saved from execution at the last minute by one of the guys who was going to kill him was a, a university friend. And he just exuded this, this non-anxious presence that's rooted in the Holy spirit. And I think you're right. Like the cut through currency of this moment you know we talk about cryptocurrency is you know like what's gonna be the next currency i said the currency that is going to like be of worth in the next season is that non-anxious presence that spiritual yep. authority roots in the holy spirit the world can't argue with that no it, it, it it's it's for those who got humble hearts who are seeking god it just shines to them so totally. yeah i think that's the way forward yeah and and if you look at christian history that is what has revolutionized the world. It's when Christians acted in a way that was so countercultural to the flesh, when they offered forgiveness that just didn't make sense, when they, when they were the ones to step in self-sacrificing and in, in, in dealing with the plague. And those are the moments when Christianity revolutionized the world. It's those supernatural love or joy or peace and hope and, and that's what we, and there's such an opportunity, like you said, such an opportunity in an anxious world 
the, the fruit of the Spirit will speak so loudly today. And so I think that seeing these things as an opportunity to like to really live out our faith in the world is going to speak so loudly and create so many opportunities to point mm -hmm. people to Jesus. So it's awesome. Um, one, one other question I have, if I can just shift real quickly. One of the things mm -hmm. I see in secular culture all the time in, in global youth culture is, you know, anxiety is like a buzzword. It's everyone's got mental health issues. Everyone does. And of course, there are real personal issues that, that we shouldn't take lightly at all. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find is that part of it is it's like, you get a certain pat on the back or an applaud for acknowledging your mm. mental health issues. And, and you see all sorts of videos and TikToks of people doing that. Um, but what happens is it, it kind of ends there. Like the acknowledgement of the problem is applauded, but there's no solution. It, it's yes. so interesting to me, like way to go, way to be brave, way to be courageous mm. and sharing the end so like how do we begin what what do you make of that and then how do we begin to introduce a hope to people that are actually quite open about these issues that they're dealing with mm -hmm. yeah totally that, that's a great a great question like i think you're right it's almost like and and even i'm hearing some language now that if you even talk about the potential of transformational hope that's actually somehow condemning which is right. really really interesting so true um like, I mean, <clears throat> I can only speak from my personal experience of at 30, having a few quite significant moments um, where the, the negative moments in my life, including something happening when I was preaching on stage um, and uh, I was diagnosed with bipolarity at, uh, at 30. And, you know, I realized that in the midst of that, there was this language saying to me, right, this, this is the direction of your life. Um, and, you know, there was almost like a sort of death knell rung, a bell ringing, you know, that, that this is what your life's going to be like. But I really felt an invitation at that moment. One, to be careful and have wisdom and operate wisely. You know, if, if you have a diabetes um, diagnosis, you don't then just go and, you know, load up on sugar and do all the wrong things. So I had to be wise. Yeah. But the second thing I really felt is that I wanted to honor God through this. Like my prayer was that God would heal me. Um, but if that healing didn't come in the way I expected, I wanted to be a witness through that, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. I remember there was a moment where I was invited to speak and, and, and almost in a sense, become a speaker who spoke just about mental health. And I said no to that. And it could have been a whole thing, yeah. but I said no to that because what I wanted to do is I wanted to honor God by showing people that they can flourish in the midst of this. There is things that you can do. And Jesus being in my life has been the biggest thing that's helped me with that. So what am I saying? Am I saying that? If you have Jesus in your life, you're not going to suffer. Now, there's, there's been there's tough times. You know, this is this issue I always have to be aware of. But with Jesus, I found this way to, I think, flourish. You know, I have a great family. I have a ministry. I've done these things. And in some ways, I would actually say that understanding this, God has used it. I mean, Scripture talks about, you know, suffering produces perseverance. Right. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. Yep. It's funny, like I was talking to my wife about this the other day. I've always looked at the first three. I've never thought of the idea that character produces hope. My, my, my prayer in the midst of this is that God has pro or, you know, produced character and I think he has built character in me. And that's a hopeful message for others. So God will use these difficulties. It's not a death sentence. Um, there are things you can do. But when people see transformation through that, and it's often not transformation out of the condition, it's often right. transformation of our right. inner life. Yep. Um, that, you know, and C.S. Lewis said, often God speaks to us loudest in our sufferings, but he's speaking loudest to us because he's inviting us to be more like him. Yeah. And I think, you know, I wanted my life to be a hopeful message for others. And so people here, and I've had that, people say, oh, I didn't realize you had that. That's great to know. Wow, okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think that hope thing comes through the invitation to, to submit our lives, the whole of our lives to Christ and to make our lives a sort of living sacrifice thing. That's our act of worship. That's good. Yeah. And yeah. it goes back again to the fact that the Christian worldview actually has good answers for suffering and, 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 and it allows, because suffering is a reality, right? We've got to account for it no matter what you believe. And as a Christian, you have a worldview that allows you to, to navigate that, that the secular worldview doesn't, right? And, and that's, I think, part of one of the explanations for the rise in anxiety and culture today. Yeah. Mm. But it's a challenge though, because as you were saying, it's like, what's praised is vulnerability, but what's rejected is absolute truth. That's so right. yes. you're allowed to say, I struggle, 
But what you're not allowed to say is here's the solution, <laughs> which is a sad, like self-defeating ideology in the end. And so that that's the challenge where you have to be willing to not just say, I, Hey, I'm one of you because obviously we are, but there is a way out. You use the analogy of the fire, right? It doesn't do the people in the theater much good. If I say, Hey, look, yeah, you're right. I see the fire too. Let's just chill. <laughs> like, no, you want to be like, let's get out of here. Right. Mm. Like I'm experiencing this too, but there is hope. Let's, let's go. Uh, and we, we face a bizarre time now where you can't point to the exit. You just have to point to the fire. And, mm. and, and that just seems like, I don't know, that, that's a tough challenge. How do we, how do we navigate that? Because mm. we, we can't just point out the, the, the problem. We have to be willing to, to be rejected also on some level. Right. Or, mm. or we're not really going to offer much hope mm. to any people other than just saying we go through it too. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like this circular logic that we get stuck in society. So, you know, we spoke about at the beginning, almost that thing that <clears throat> my individual life is going to be this wonderful thing. Like in the last phase, when we thought the world was heading this wonderful thing, well, my life's going to be wonderful and I'm achieving all these things and look what I'm doing. So that's sort of triumphalism, you know, but then we realize it's not working. So instead of like actually looking at that wisely and discerning that and going, okay, what parts of that is good? What parts are bad? You know? We then flip to the opposite. We're almost moving from triumphalism to defeatism, you know, is what you're saying. Like, you know, I've got the answers. No, no one's got the answers. And I think to, to break that, that cycle, you're right. You have to be willing to be unpopular mm -hmm. and say something that's outside of that culture's answers. You know, one thing I've often said, you've got to disobey the culture mm -hmm. to serve the culture that's and it. love it yep. um, because it's just stuck in a cycle, you know. And I think at this moment, We've got people who are spinning through that cycle, you know, and, and often we're dealing, often what culture's trend is dealing with the problems created by the last solution. And, that's right. and you know, that's what happens in a world that doesn't have Jesus. Yeah. And I think Jesus offers this different way, but to do that, it's not always going to be popular. That's so, great. so maybe just to wrap up on a practical note, like how, what, what step does somebody take? right? They, they feel anxious. They, they perceive the anxiety in the world around them. They, they might think they have some answers to it uh, theologically, but they, they wonder if they even have the authority to speak on it. You mentioned the, the risk of the spiritual disciplines. I, I wouldn't put it like that. I know you're obviously a big believer mm -hmm. in spiritual disciplines, but mm -hmm. you, you don't want to just, okay, well, I'll just get my own house in order, but how does that translate outside of the world I, I'm living in? What, what steps does someone take if they feel immobilized by the magnitude of the problem inside and outside of their own life? Yeah. Look, one, one of my big statements is crisis precedes renewal. So if you're in a crisis, this is a, an incredible place filled with opportunity to build something new. Often when you're in a tiny crisis or not even a crisis, but a bad place, that could turn into a crisis at a time in your life when you can't really do much about it or, you know, like it's, it, it's an opportunity that this is happening now. So you, you can make a change now. What I realized is that discipleship for me was one of the biggest answers to, to mental health issues. Number one, to have a routine. When, when I first got diagnosed, I spoke to a psychiatrist and he said, one of the best things we find is that there's a routine actually helps our minds. You know, Jesus puts our life in a kind of routine. We're following him. Like there's repeated patterns. Being part of a community, um, a Christian community is just one of the most wonderful things. You know, like part of the reason so many people experiencing anxiety and mental health issues is community has absolutely Loneliness. broken down. Yep. You know, like Emil Durkheim said this, you know, a hundred years ago called Anomie. It's like this dislocation from individuals from society is what's driving so much mental health. Totally. Um, but, you know, when, when you say, Jesus, remake me in your image, that is a journey to healing that is going to happen at every single level in your life. You know, that I think, you know, like one of the things that I've, I've often said too is if you look at Jean Twenge's book about um, the iPhone, where she talks about the iPhone, if you look at the advent of the iPhone and the mental health of young people, it absolutely deteriorates within about a year of the iPhone being invented, like everything, suicidal ideation, you know, anxiety, the iPhone comes. So what that says to me is there's really practical things you can do. Looking at your phone less will make you less anxious. That is just, the scientists say that, you know, like why do the guys in Silicon Valley not let their kids have yeah. iPads? Steve Jobs would not let his kid have an iPad. Yeah. Um, when you're around community, when you have a purpose in your life, when you eat well, when you sleep well, these things all 
change how we live. So I see that actually the invitation into the Christian life is the renewal, which will help this, 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 this great ailment that we're experiencing as a culture. So this is where I see, you know, we need an awakening. We need a revival of, you know, uh, faith. And this is going to be one of the great answers. So my prayer is that in the midst of this crisis, we can actually discover not just the answer to this crisis, but even a bigger answer that exceeds what where our hopes are. And that's actually, yeah. I think, the, the church um, being, you know, revived in, in a way in this time. Yeah, and it's it's uh, recognizing the fact that, that Jesus is the author and designer of all good things. And so to live in as close and of an alignment with him as possible is going to mean flourishing in your life that's going to be enviable. And enviable yes. people are going to say yes. I, I i see how you treat people i see how you have your life in order i mean a lot of why so much of jordan peterson's message resonates with so many people is because it's he i think he taps into the sort of the the ordering of your life that really reflects how we're designed in god and people want they want their life to make sense they want to have purpose they want to feel like they're on track and that they're not just wasting their lives and so I, I, again, I often say you can't give what you don't have. And so it's not a rejection mm. of the world or uh, cloistering yourself off. But man, it's got to, like you said, it's got to start with a vibrant intimacy with Jesus that leads to the kind of life that people look at and say, man, that ain't perfect, but there's something there that I, I see is working. And it's not, it's not wrong in our sort of post-Reformation, nothing is earned, scary version of Christianity. It's okay to say that like God actually wants you to, do better he wants your life mm. to be he wants you to to get rid of stuff and grow mm -hmm. and become sanctified and that's okay yep. it's like yep. it doesn't mean you're like it's not religion to say that you want mm. it you know i'm always praying god deal with the stuff in my life so that yes because because your way is best and if you mm. pursue that honestly that will also of course lead you outside of yourself because that is another mm. thing jesus does for you is take your eyes off yourself right so mm. yeah it's, it's it's funny how no matter how complex the problems get the solutions stay pretty simple even if they're yes. very hard to execute right yes, totally. so nothing new under the sun mm, yeah i mean just to, just to add to like i mean i just literally preached on it this sunday like i think we've bought this myth that we've got our private lives and that's our little realm and sure. it's our, our, our public lives when what we know from psychology is that the people who are around you if they lose weight you lose weight if yeah. they take up smoking you take up smoking and, you know, what you realize is that humans are infectious. This was my son. I said, yeah, yeah, we've learned yeah. the, the infectiousness of COVID. Well, yeah. humans are infectious. Your healing is infectious. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's mm -hmm. no on and off switch. Mm -hmm. So the interchange, we will pursue healing. You, you get a group of your friends together and say, we're going to go a different way. We're going to pursue Jesus. We're just going to do that. Yep, there's going to be tough times. We're going to share those, those good news stories. That becomes a, a, like a, a little super spreader event mm -hmm. <laughs> of healing. You know, so, so be, be encouraged that healing is infectious. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's cool. And you expanded sort of what I was saying to a community of believers, which is where it's best played out. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. It's good for me, but man, when a group of us start doing it, yep. Yes. you know, like 12, maybe, you know, that, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think that's when things really multiply. It so, the world. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. That's I awesome. really, really appreciate it. Um, Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I could have this conversation all day, but for out of respect for your time, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I want to point people in the direction of, uh, well, I guess I'm going to do the website here if I can get there. Uh, Mark Is that correct? Mm. Yeah, that's correct. Co. Yeah. That co. All right. So go and check that out. Obviously the book that we've kind of been talking about, about um, to some degree a non anxious presence, go check that out. Uh, otherwise I would imagine everything else uh, that you've written is there. All the other information how to connect with you would be there. Um, so again, that's marksayers.co. Um, otherwise, thanks, man. This has been a, a real privilege for me, uh, Aaron, I'm sure as well. And uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind closing for us in prayer for those listening, that, yeah. that God would use them in this space in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, for the sake of the world, that would be that'd be a great way to close mm -hmm. if you would, if you'd be willing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, we just come before you in this moment and, and, and we realize this is a moment in the world that the stories that have been told are falling over. But we recognize the story, the gospel that you have released into the world through your life, through your death on the cross, through your resurrection, that that is the one true story. And my prayer is at this moment, Father, that those listening who feel a sense of anxiety, who feel unsureness around what is happening, perhaps even that pain, perhaps even isolation, 
And in the midst of that, Father, you can meet them. I do pray, Father, that we can begin the journey of transformation and walking towards you. And I just want to really boldly pray, pray, Father, that people listening to this all over the world, wherever they are, that that work of transformation that you want to bring in the world can actually just begin in their lives. And actually, we just pray that you do a new thing at this moment. Um, I just have the image that you've scattered seeds throughout the world Mm. and seeds of growth. And and maybe in the last couple of seasons of so much dislocation, I think of COVID and and all the different stuff that's happening in the world, just the the sort of rethink of our lives we've had to do. I just pray in the midst of that, may that be a seed bed out of which you just grow oaks of righteousness. Mm. I particularly pray for the next generation, Father. We know that there's so much concern, even in the culture, about their direction. But I pray, Father, you do a different thing. May we have people who go in the opposite spirit to the culture and instead follow you. So I just pray in Jesus' name, raise up a mighty remnant at this time. Yeah. Give us hope. Give us a vision. Give us your love. We ask and pray. And we just pray, Father, do it again. Yeah. May we look back at even this moment in years to come and realize that perhaps was the moment, that moment of prayer where that new thing began. So may we perceive it. May we, may we see you do something in, in this time. We ask and pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Mark. Have a awesome. great thank rest you. of your day. And uh, I know those who are listening to this both now and, and later will really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And uh, God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, hopefully we can talk again down the road. Thanks so much, guys. Really, Yeah, we're going to hit this uh, little closing video, and then we'll just say goodbye to you offline real quick. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.